From maintenance of county roads to the administration of criminal justice. From determining the taxable value of real property to controlling the spread of infectious diseases. From protecting children and the elderly to marriage licenses and motor vehicle transactions. From keeping the peace to protecting our environment and making sure that your vote counts. El Paso County government is working for you. Welcome to El Paso County Works. This program is produced by the El Paso County Public Information Office to inform citizens about the programs and services of Colorado's most populous county. Ken and Kathy, thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having us. Yes. Well, I mean, we've got a, a flood season coming up. Uh, well, monsoon season is on us, and uh, we've got additional concerns in the area based on uh, the Waldo Canyon fire last year. And uh, both of you in emergency services with the county and the city have uh, done a lot so far, but we're not really sure what will happen. And I, I think maybe one of the best places to start is, I noticed last fall they had these uh, seeding drops in the Waldo Canyon area, and uh, that, we're gonna have to wait to see if anything's growing before we can really move on with the plan, can't we? That's correct. They, they drop seed and mulch throughout several uh, acres within the, uh, the burn area, mm -hmm. uh, places that they thought they could get some growth started. Now they're waiting for the spring to see what growth actually happens, and then we can go back and reevaluate where we need to do additional work. Okay, so the, go, go ahead. Yes, and another thing about the mulching, that was a very important first step to a lot of reclamation work that has to get done in the SCAR. Mm -hmm. uh, an important thing to understand about the mulching is uh, it was a great first step, but about 60% or actually I'll back up a little. A large part of the burned area is too steep uh, for that kind of treatment to help. So it was very important. It was a good place to start. Uh, the way I refer to that, it was a very, it's a band-aid on a very large wound. Mm -hmm. uh, there are going to be a lot of band-aids, a lot of treatments that we can put into effect up into the scar in the coming years. And they're all going to do something. They're all going to help, but they are relatively small in the great scheme of things mm -hmm. that is that burn. I know you have a plan in place. Let's let's talk about mm -hmm. that. Seeding, probably the uh, first step in the plan to see if we can't get some vegetation on the uh, hillside. What comes after that? Well, it, it all depends on what the National Forest Service decides. Most of the land was National Forest Service. Um, so they are actually looking at these processes and letting us know what they have available. Most of the work is being completed right now by volunteer organizations going up, working with the National Forest Service. Mm -hmm. uh, the Coalition for the Upper South Platte is one of those lead organizations along with several others. They're kind of teaming up to make that uh, effort go in that area, but again, we have to wait and see what happens this spring with the vegetation. Okay. We don't want volunteers trampling over the new vegetation long mm -hmm. process. What are some of the uh, main areas of concern for flash flooding? I mean, the, yes. the landscape has changed greatly and uh, areas that maybe weren't vulnerable before are today. Yes, um, one of the great ironies of, of this disaster is that many of the communities that were spared the fire mm -hmm. are now at disproportionate risk of flood. Uh, specifically, uh, many of our communities in Ute Pass, mm -hmm. all the way from Ch Chapita Park in that area all the way down through Manitou Springs, uh, past the confluence of Fountain and Manit uh, Mon Monument Creeks and then down into Fountain and Wyfield Security in that area. Uh, but particularly those, those communities in Ute Pass uh, are the county's greatest concern at this point. Uh, I know the city has also concerns on the west side, Ken. Yeah, we've got uh, the Camp Creek area, which mm -hmm. goes down through Garden of the Gods and out 31st Street is a real high concern for us because of the population in that area. Uh, we also have the north and south Douglas Creeks, um, all higher risk because of the flood, but again, we don't know what the risk is until we have some flood water and sure. see what kind of debris is going to come with it. And that, that's the key here is the debris. As the debris comes down with a, a great volume of water, that may uh, clog up the waterways uh, and then adding to the floodplain area. Correct. Any, any place a creek goes under a bridge or into a culvert, there's a, a high chance of the debris packing up that entrance 
and then causing the water to go out overtopping the road or going out in through out of the channels itself. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things uh, that it's important to remember is that uh, mudslides, debris flows, uh, and flash flooding have always been a feature of this landscape. This is something that our entire region has had to deal with since people moved here. Uh, we have records of catastrophic floods in 1935, in the 60s, and even in the 90s. Uh, and with all of those floods, mud came with it. The, the landscape in, the, in our mountains is very erodible. It's very crumbly. So sand and, and gravel come down very easily. And this has always been a problem. But the Waldo Canyon Fire has magnified this problem. So it's the same problem we've always had, just larger. Because now 60% of the burned area in the Waldo Canyon burn has been burned to the point where the water will not absorb in the soil anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to take many, many years to heal. So we have the same problem of flooding, but it's a larger problem. More water is going to come down, and with that water, a great deal of mud, sand, and gravel will come down as well. Is there an infrastructure or structures in place on the side of the mountains where possible to maybe divert the water or slow it down or take care of some of the debris? Yeah, we, uh, the city's been working real closely with the navigators mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. in the uh, Camp Creek area. We've got some debris catch uh, racks built up there, 20-foot fences that span the valleys that the water's going to be coming through. These are made to catch that large amount of debris that's going to be coming down. We also have what's called catchment basins. They're basically holes dug in the valleys so that as the boulders come down, they will fall to the bottom and be caught in these different uh, the pits along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the Ute Pass area, uh, unfortunately there are not as many opportunities yet for building those sort of structures. Uh, the county is looking at building, actually rehabilitating an existing catchment basin up near Rainbow Falls, uh, but many of the canyons that drain into the Ute Pass area mm -hmm. are just not well suited to, to build the kind of structures that are going to be necessary to catch a lot of debris. So our main focus at this point is to advise people that the water and the debris is going to come down mm -hmm. and that it's our number one job at this point to learn how to get out of the way. And it's not just the people here in Colorado Springs or in El Paso County that will be impacted by this. Mm -hmm. People downstream as well. Mm -hmm. People downstream will be affected as well. Another thing that we're looking at very closely is uh, Highway 24 mm -hmm. of Butte Pass. As folks can remember, during the fire, Highway 24 was shut down for more than a week. This had a huge, huge economic impact to many people who were not otherwise affected by the fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a major flood in the Ute Pass area, we could see enough road damage uh, or debris on the road to, again, interrupt travel in that area. Is there a way uh, that people can find out their own personal risk of flash flooding in their neighborhood or their home or their area? Excellent question. We, we've developed a website between the city, the county, the U.S. Forest Service, and FEMA to give you that opportunity to learn your risk. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to springsgov.com and under the hot topics you look for flood, uh, flood risk assessment. There's an interactive map in that section there on our flood information page where you can put your address in and look down to that individual lot level, see where you're in relationship to those floodplains. Uh, right now it lists the 100 year floodplains for FEMA, but what we're doing uh, we're treating that as our 10-year uh, floodplain. So we're saying if you're close to that, you need to start thinking about your plan. Okay. Uh, the simple solution is you walk outside, look for where the water is. If you're looking up at the water, you're downstream. If you're up above the water, you've got a lower risk. Is, is there a lot individual homeowners can do in some cases? Um, Knowing, knowing your risk is the first step to making a good plan. Okay. Uh, because d literally where you are is, is going to be the biggest, the biggest uh, concern as to what you're going to do with this. So first of all, you have to find out if you're at risk. So the, the interactive viewer that Ken just referred to is an excellent tool mm -hmm. to start getting an idea of, of where you sit in relationship to the water and in relationship to a potential flood. Uh, but there are many things that folks can do to make a personal plan based on the risk. If, for example, if you know that your home is in a very high risk area for a flood, then you need to be thinking about how to quickly relocate your family up and out of that area. Just get up as quickly as possible from where you are, even if that means on foot. Uh, if you're farther away, 
and not an immediate risk of flood, well, your family plan may be completely different. You might not have to consider the immediate effects of a flood, but you also might have to think about, is your transportation route going to be affected? So it all comes down first to finding out where the threat is, where your home is, where your business is, where your children's school is in relation to that threat. And planning starts from there. And we have many, many uh, good websites that we can point folks to to get them uh, some tools that they need to start making a plan. This sounds very similar to what we went through last summer in terms of fire preparedness. And, uh, you know, you want to be ready to go. You don't want to, um, you know, live in, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to be scared, I guess, but you want to be prepared and ready to go. And we saw how important it was to be able to just pick up and leave the area at a moment's notice. Let's talk about where that notice comes from. How will people be alerted to the danger? Well, the, the first method is you walk outside and you look up in the sky and if you see rain mm -hmm. and you know you're in a high risk yeah. area, there's your alert right okay. there. You need to th start thinking, do I have my plan ready? You gotta pay attention. Pay attention to your okay. surroundings. Sure. L listen to your local media. TV, radio, K-Light would be an excellent source there. Mm -hmm. um, listen to what you have access to. We do have the emergency notification system where you go into El Paso Teller 911.org, mm -hmm. register your cell phones, your VoIP phones, get on the alert system. But again, that takes time for us to send that message out we're talking minutes here on flash flooding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other option is the NOAA weather radios. The, uh, these ra radios that sit there and they'll go off when you have an alert. Sure. Uh, they have those many varieties. You can get them with digital display displays. You can get things that shake your beds and turn the lights on in your house. Mm -hmm. Now I know the Manitou area, mm -hmm. they have a new siren warning yes. system coming up. Yes, uh, the Manitou Springs area is very serious about, uh, especially about taking care of its guests. Manitou is a, is a tourist economy. Uh, they take their the safety and the welfare of their guests very seriously, and, and the siren is part of that. Uh, the sirens are only really audible in the, the highest risk areas along the creek. It's is not a siren that can be heard all over Manitou Springs, uh, but it's going to be a very important part of the warning system there. Uh, because there will be many folks in Manitou who have never been there before and who don't understand the local threat. But this brings up a very important point about how you're informed about an emergency. Think of it as a, a multi-layered system. The more layers of information that you can get, the better off you're going to be. So emergency notifications is a very important layer. So we want that cell phone and that, that voice over IP digital phone to be registered so we can get that message to you. Uh, being aware, just listening to the news, getting in the habit of checking the weather forecast every morning, looking at the sky, uh, staying in tune with your local uh, local media, uh, signing up for uh, automatic notifications uh, for text messaging from the weather service. There are many, many, many sources of information. Uh, the trick is to not rely on just one. Mm -hmm. We need to get in the habit of using all of our resources to stay in aware. aware. Is, are, are there available online um, sites or areas where it would be, okay, you, I live here, where do I want to go to when these types of situations come up? The, what we're doing right now is telling people that that's where you start your plan is deciding those factors. Mm -hmm. We can't tell you that your house is safest to go here because we don't know what the rain's going to do okay. when it happens. We'll have a better idea have after a plan. the summer. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, have a plan. I can go to point A, B, C, or D. I look out and see where the water is, I go to point D. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, I'm sorry. Go ahead. This is an important point about the difference between a fire and a flood. During a fire, we talk about evacuation. We take an entire neighborhood, notify people that your neighborhood is in danger and every one of you needs to move to another place. You need to get in your cars and go hit the roads and go somewhere else. In a flash flood, first of all, there is no time. You might have minutes of no notice from the time a flash flood warning goes up to the point where an, a flood actually threatens your home. In that situation, we do not want people to think evacuation. What we want you to do is think go up. Go up in the quickest way from wherever it is you need to be. So you need to be very aware of where the water is in the place where you are. Understand how your home sits. 
to use these wonderful online tools to, to figure out where your risk is, but to do the same thing for your business, do the same thing for your school, so that when that flash flood warning goes up, you know that from your home you need to climb a hillside, perhaps. Uh, we In many cases, we don't want folks to think about, let's pack up the car, let's get on the road, because here's why. Many roads follow creeks. They follow low-lying areas. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they cross creeks. Mm -hmm. uh, half of the people who die in flash floods do so in their vehicles because they're caught in flood water. We want people to think, go up. Go up as quickly as possible. Now, as you say that, a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of the structures in Colorado Springs are two-story homes. Mm -hmm. Is going to the upper floor on your home going to help you? In many ways, it could. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't know about the debris flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're far enough away, that might be your best option. Mm -hmm. One thing we want to reiterate on the the debris flow, though, is if you get trapped in water, we've got boulders, large trees, mm -hmm. all kinds of other stuff in this water it's going to make it virtually impossible for our rescue teams to even get into the water to try to rescue you. Mm -hmm. So find a way to stay out of the water, stay in a safe high place, whether that's the upper floor of your house, whether it's a neighbor two blocks away that's a little bit higher uh, elevation than you are. Mm -hmm. Have a plan in place. Mm -hmm. Practice your plan. Mm -hmm. And this summer will probably be the worst of the coming just because of the debris mm -hmm. on the side of the hill that may potentially come down with They're the still having flooding out of the Hayman fire. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 10 years ago. Wow. Um, so we're we're thinking that this year will be our learning opportunity, but it's not the end. Have it, we learned things from that fire? We've learned many things from the Hayman fire. One of the things that's a great advantage to us here in this area is that our neighbors in Teller County have had to deal with the Hayman fire now for 10 years. We mentioned an organization called the Coalition for the Upper South Platte. That group came together to do environmental restoration after the Hayman fire. Those folks know an awful lot about post-fire flooding now, and they've been great, great partners for us as we've started our learning process. Uh, but Ken makes a very good point. This is a long, long-term process. Nature has a longer time span than we humans. Mm -hmm. uh, the Waldo Canyon fire and the flooding that is going to follow this fire is just part of the, the great uh, process that has shaped the Rocky Mountains. And we're just a blip on that radar in, in that scale of time. So as humans, we have to adapt to this new environment. Did, will, will this change uh, in terms of uh, growth of Colorado Springs, of El Paso County, where people decide to build their homes? Is this going to change how maybe we look at the area in terms of building? Well, the, risk, the risk has been modified, but I don't think it's changed our environment here. We're still, mm -hmm. We've had flash flooding a couple mm -hmm. weeks before the Waldo Canyon fire. We had flooding around the Citadel Mall. Yeah. We haven't cha seen any changes in population movement around the whole, mm -hmm. all this flooding that okay. we've had before the fire. We don't anticipate it. We just want people to be smarter. You all, like you said before, we all, you need a plan no matter what the hazard, whether it's tornadoes, wildfire, flood, mm -hmm. or power outage. Mm -hmm. What do you do? And have a plan. Really, every, everybody in the area is at risk of something, I of guess. Of something. The way I put it to folks is that Los Angeles has earthquakes, mm -hmm. big ones. People still love to go visit, and many people love to live in L.A. Not us personally. We like to live in the Pikes Peak region a lot better. I grew up in hurricane country in the area around New Orleans, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Lots of hurricanes there. People live on the seashores. Uh, the same thing goes for us. Once you understand what is normal for your area, you know how to deal with it. People don't stop living on the seashore just because there's an occasional hurricane. Sure. The Pikes Peak region is still a wonderful place to live, a great place to, to raise a family, a wonderful place to visit and have fun. We're just going to make a few adjustments to learn to deal with this new feature of our environment, and then we'll go on. I know we, uh, my family's made a choice to stay away from California during earthquake season. And That's right. It's very like hurricane season <laughs> and tornado season. <laughs> you know, the primary concern here is to save lives. Yes. And uh, that is, you are the most valuable asset we have really in the Pikes Peak area, uh, the people who make up the area. Uh, there is, though, concern about uh, the homes that you live in, flood insurance, that's a must now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, we, we recommend everybody evaluate your risk, mm -hmm. look at the flood insurance option, understand the flood insurance because it doesn't cover everything and it has some limitations. 
but decide, is that what you need? Mm -hmm. okay. um, if you're in the flood zone, your mortgage company is going to require it. But you might be just on the edge. It might be a good option for you, but it's your business decision, your personal finance decision. What do you want? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. Flood true. insurance, we want to emphasize, is a very, very important per part of your personal financial plan. Financial planning is a very important part of your disaster planning. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a really rough fire called uh, uh, up in Boulder County, mm -hmm. uh, the Four Mile Canyon fire. That's right. And after that fire, which at that time was the worst fire in Colorado, after that fire, many people found out that they were underinsured to the point where they could not afford to rebuild after that fire, or at least not the kind of home that they lost. So we want to encourage everybody to not only look at flood insurance, but look at your look at your homeowner's insurance. Make sure you have renter's insurance. Uh, many folks do not cover, co do, do not carry renter's insurance, and then find out after a disaster. Now they've lost everything. It's this is a very very important thing to look at. Okay, let's talk about um, go back a step or two to preparedness, and uh, you know in terms of an emergency kit for your home. What kinds of things would we want to put in there? Well, first thing we would start off with is. If you have any special medical needs, mm -hmm. make sure you have those supplies available to you. Does it, I mean, it could be in your kit. My, I personally have to take medicine that's in, uh, refrigerated all the time. Mm -hmm. I have a refrigerator, or I have a box in my father-in-law's house with my insulin. Mm -hmm. That way, if I can't get to my house, I've got a backup You've system. You've got a supply. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Okay. Uh, important paperwork, your birth certificate, your driver's license, a copy of your insurance. What paperwork could you not live without? Mm -hmm. Here, my, just to give you an example of my plan, I have a f safe in my house. I've got four folders, one with my paperwork, one with, two of them with my brothers, and one with my parents. Mm -hmm. My brothers have the exact same safe. All of my family, we share our paperwork with each other, so if one of our houses is damaged, we can go to the other person's house and get our important paperwork. That's, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. That really is. The important thing to understand about emergency kits, first of all, is that you need to think in terms of dealing with being away from home, being on your own for about three days. The way I describe it to folks is it's almost like urban camping. You, you, you're going to pack the same things you would pack for, for most of a, a camping trip. Some food, some water, your important medications, things like that. The, the things that you need to sustain yourself for three days. Uh, the other really important thing to understand about kits is that they are unique. Uh, you can go online right now and there's a lot of companies there that will gladly sell you an emergency kit. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. If I bought one of those, very much like Ken was describing, I've got some special needs. Uh, I can't eat wheat-based foods. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I'm going to have to throw away all the crackers and cookies sure. and things like that. They're, it's not going to do me any good. So each member of your family is going to have a need that dictates what goes in that kit. Children are going to use have different things in a kit than adults. Elderly folks are going to have a different things in their kit. So there, again, the websites we've, we've provided you links for for your site, uh, there's lots of great information about that. Uh, you can start with the Red Cross, many, many groups will give you some wonderful checklists that you can start with. But at that point, then make it work for you. Uh, put in the things that you need, take in the, out the things that you won't, and think in terms of three days. Also, too, uh, personal mementos. You'll probably want to yes. take some of those with you as well, at least have them in the emergency right. kit, because mm -hmm. let's face it, every every home has personal mementos mm -hmm. handed down through generations that are very unique and very special to you. Know, know exactly what's important to you, mm -hmm. and just plan. I've only got a few minutes to grab what I need. Yeah. Maybe have pictures of your photos on a thumb drive that you keep mm -hmm. in your emergency kit. Yeah. They have systems to repair photos after they're damaged during fires or tornadoes or floods, but they are quite the same. They're not the original. Mm -hmm. So get a copy, store it somewhere safe, whether it's on a thumb drive in your kit or at a neighbor's I, I love the whole idea of thumb drives. Just as here's a guy who mm -hmm. takes I don't know thousands of pictures mm -hmm. a year, and I just lost my hard drive and my backup oh. hard drive went a week later. Yep. So you know, uh -huh. thumb drives I think are a, a really mm -hmm. nice way to uh, take care of that. They, they explore your risk. What accept, what's yeah. acceptable to you? Mm -hmm. And go, I mean, my parents had a house fire when I was about 13. I have no fire pictures of me when I was a kid because mm -hmm. we didn't have a backup. 
Another thing to think about in terms of kits, and this goes back to the difference between fire and flood, is even in a fire, you might have a couple of minutes mm -hmm. to gather some things up. Uh, even, even during a fast-moving fire, you might have five minutes, even though that's a terrible thing to think about, getting out of your house in only five minutes. If you are at high risk of a flash flood, if you go on one of our online maps and see that you're smack dab right in the bullseye of, of a flooding area, that you need to think in terms of having that kit pre-packed, ready to go, ready to grab. That's why they're called go kits in many cases. Mm -hmm. Have it where you can pick it up and walk out the door because you may not have five minutes. Uh, we want to emphasize to everybody that don't plan on going around your house and picking things up. Have it ready to go, have it in your car, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're in an area where you know you're going to get out, get up out of your house, if you're going to climb, then have it by the door. Pick it up, walk out, don't look back. Yeah, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. We've got about five minutes left here real quick. I want to talk about uh, Sandbag Day. That's coming up mm -hmm. in April. April 13th, we are going to be doing a sandbag giveaway at the uh, Verizon building on 30th and uh, Garden of the Gods. Okay. They've donated us a side of their building to use. We've got 150 tons of sand donated for that day, mm -hmm. and we're lining up volunteers to come out and fill those bags for the people in the neighborhood that needs those. Okay. Uh, last year we did 150 tons, about 12,000 sandbags, gave those away to all the residents up there. Uh, the sandbags aren't the only solution. They are kind of like that safety measure to buy a little bit of more time and maybe mm -hmm. keep a little water out of your house. But again, with the flash flood, they're going to go quick. Yeah. So we, we just want to warn people that the sandbags are a temporary fix to a long-term problem. Mm -hmm. We also have available unfilled sandbags at the fire stations in the Mountain Shadows area. Mm -hmm. Stations 9, 12, 5, and 18. You just go by any of those stations or Colorado Springs together and pick up the empty bags. You'll have to find some sand and uh, fill those up, or you can use dirt, whatever, but they're a little bit easier to store. So we're giving people some options here. Do you want to keep filled sandbags around, or do you don't want to keep the unfilled ones? Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd love to leave people with at this point is, uh, you, you mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago that uh, folks in the emergency services are the most important part of our safety, and, and I will challenge you on that and say, no, I don't think that's the case. Individuals are the most important factor in our community safety uh, because it's the individual decisions that people make, the individual plans that they put in place, and the individual actions that they take that really, really improve their outcome in a disaster. So we're all in this together. Your local government is working really, really hard to, to mitigate flood risks, to put plans in place to respond to a flood emergency. We've been working on that since the fire was still going mm -hmm. on. Uh, but every individual and every family in our area has also got to do their part. And we're we're going to work on this together. So when each family knows the risk, then makes a plan, then that family will improve the outcome for that for that family in a disaster. Uh, nobody can just expect somebody else to solve the problem. Each of us is going to solve a piece of it. We're going to work together on it. And together as a community, we're going to come through this. We're going to learn to work with this new environment and, and we'll adapt and overcome. I think uh, like you share documents with family members, make sure you share your plan with your family and your friends exactly. mm -hmm. so everyone knows what your exit plan is and you can be located. Real quickly, before I let uh, both of you go, I want to mention there are a number of websites with uh, great information on uh, emergency preparedness and flash flooding through El Paso County, uh, where to get information during an emergency. Uh, we will post all this on our website at klight 106 com and you'll have it there. But uh, valuable information. We could have a very interesting summer ahead. And first off, I, I, before I let you go, I want to say it's wonderful that uh, both the city and the county are working so diligently together on this for the uh, better good of our area. And uh, I, I need to commend uh, both institutions for that because it is of vital importance. We, we have slightly different risks, but we have the same objectives. Mm -hmm. Make sure people are prepared for their the changes in the environment here. Yeah. 
Ken, Kathy, thank you so much for coming in this morning. We will uh, maybe hear from you later in the summer as uh, we have a better of idea of what will happen during the rains and uh, as plans move forward. So thank you both right. so much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. El Paso County Works is aired on the Pikes Peak Library District channel at 10 p.m. on the second and fourth Friday of each month. If you have suggestions for future program topics, please contact Jennifer Brown at jenniferbrown at elpasoco.com or call 238-4478.